and Gavin, uh, who's who's going to be joining Gavin Bain, who's going to be joining us and talking about his experiences with passing the baton. And uh, obviously, I'm here to talk about the legal side. Um, Catherine will talk about the financial and the um, the, the, the taxation accounting side. Um, and Gavin, the war story side, I suppose. And um, I know Catherine will give a, a better introduction, supplementary introduction than I can, but um, I'm just delighted to be able to bring the, the three of us to, 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 be, to be able to be speaking with you and your um, members today, Sam. So Catherine, um, what did I miss in the introduction? <laughs> Fantastic introduction, Stephen. Um, look, welcome everybody and thank you very much to Sam for encouraging us through Stephen to put on this webinar, this session for you today. And thanks Beck, for running the slide deck behind the scenes for us as well, appreciate it. Um, we actually ran this presentation last week to a wider audience, global audience, and it was extremely well received. So I'm very grateful that we have this opportunity to present it to you. We'll have some Q&A at the end as well. But for those of you that don't know me, I'm Catherine Williams. I'm the owner of KMIT, the finance and pricing consultancy working across Australia for, gosh, it probably be about 17, 18 years now. I work with all agencies above the line, below the line, on the line, in between the line, um, across the line. Um, that could be digital, it, purely digital web, SEO, SEM. It could be advertising design, experiential, a lot of PR agencies as well. and and full service agencies that offer a mix of those. My role predominantly is CFO and I come in and I work with the finance team for a larger organisation that already has a finance team in play with, I guess, the smarts that I've learned over the years, starting 23 years ago with Clemenger BBDO and then working globally with multinational agencies and then starting my own business here in Australia, bringing to you agency owners what others in the industry are doing really well and what I've learned through the years. I participate a lot in a lot of PD and leadership training globally and liaise with other consultants like Tim Williams from Ignition, Ron Backer from Verisage and many, many others around the globe. So working with agency leaders to set the targets for the year, so really looking at the balance sheet and what do we owe, P&L, what can we achieve, certainly in this COVID environment and then helping their middle managers and finance team see the commercial side. And yes, it is all about numbers. Um, I actually don't like numbers. I like what it does though. What we can do with the money at the end of the day is what's really important, which is paying our people, giving them great technology and helping them to understand what you automatically understand as agency owners, the commercial aspect and working with clients and suppliers and partners. So I do the training, I guess, and the CFO work through keynotes, workshops, uh, how-to booklets and webinars like this. Um, so every month came in has been hosting a webinar with great partners and this month it has been with Stephen and Gavin as well. Um, I'll pass you back to Stephen to give you a little bit more side on the legal aspect as to what he's bringing today. He's worked with so many different agencies over the years, big and small, with merge and acquisition. Um, and Gavin, a past client and friend of mine, I worked with Gavin and the team, um, Martin Beecroft and Melanie Wise at Meerkats before they then prepared a couple of years later to merge with Wonderman Thompson in Perth. So I'm really thrilled that Gavin's joining us today to share a little bit about his story um, and the preparation. I think you'll find it really intriguing because many of you, if you're not ready for sale, um, it probably does take a few years to get yourself ready. I'm going to help you think about it from a financials perspective and from your culture, your people, and from yourself. If you're the owner, what does it mean for you as well? Stephen, I'll pass back to you to talk a little bit more about the, the legal involvement you've had with other agencies buying and selling, representing both parties. Oh, thank you, Catherine. Well, just as a brief introduction, um, some, may, some, some of your members listening may know me. Um, I've certainly worked with Gavin Bain in the past, Meerkats, for many years, and uh, Catherine, you and I go back, way back as well, almost 20 years now, I think, um, or somewhere close to that. The time's ripping by. But um, look, I've had the privilege of working um, and serving the media and communications uh, sectors for some 25 years now. I'm a partner at Bombons for Legal. We're a specialist boutique firm based in Surrey Hills, and we do work with um, individuals, SMEs, um, public companies, both Australia and overseas. Um, in addition to the work I do in commercial work, intellectual property, I have practiced extensively in mergers and acquisitions. 
And um, in recent times, I, I've, I've been doing this sort of work for some 15 plus years. In recent times, I've worked on the Match Media deal, the Highland Media deal, um, and just recently, the acquisition of Atibo of 303 Mullen Low um, here in Sydney, um, and Atibo is in New Zealand. So I've been involved in many, many acquisitions on both sides. So it's been a real privilege to be able to do so. I also work on the other side of the spectrum. So the happy days of the acquisition, I also work extensively in litigation. And I was the lawyer that ran the Icon Communications test case um, three years ago in the Supreme Court, successfully winning the case for Icon. And just recently, late last year, the ECOM authority case, uh, I won that one as well. So it's interesting to see both sides of the spectrum and all things in between. Uh, I do a bit of work uh, uh, and serve the industry bodies. I love working with the IMAA. I was very excited when um, it all first started and helping them get underway. Um, I do work with the Ad Council, the Comms Council before that, and before that, they were known as the Advertising Federation. I've worked with them. I do work with the influencer body, AIMCO, the newly established body, the shopper marketing body, um, and a number of smaller bodies. So I, I just love working with the industry and seeing what everyone's up to to remain relevant and provide um, hopefully better services to my clients. So at the end of the day, um, if there are any insights I can share with you, uh, answer any questions you may or may have if you're deciding to pass that baton. Um, and uh, hopefully we can answer some questions today or I'm very happy to take questions afterwards um, offline as well. So thank you, Kate. Fantastic. So we might actually kick off, as you can see on your screen there, the overview with a case study, a really recent one, exciting one. And I'm going to introduce to you now Gavin Bain, the Managing Director of Wonderman Thompson Perth. Gavin, would you like to share a little bit about your, your story? Thanks, Catherine. Um, thanks so much for the invitation to do this again. Um, yeah, for uh, Meerkats was 16 years old when we merged with Wonderman Thompson in Perth. Um, it was actually founded um, the same year as Facebook, um, who've done marginally better. Uh, but um, by two guys, Mike Edmonds and Ronnie Duncan, if you can't tell, that's a, that's a joke I've told maybe once or twice. Um, Mike Edmonds and Ronnie Duncan founded it. Other three of us worked at Market Force here locally in Perth. Um, I joined um, as the managing director uh, after about five years, uh, once they grew to a size where they needed a little bit more management support and then became the CEO. Um, the going in, uh, the agreement with myself and Mike and Ronnie as the founders was that at some point I would help them exit. Um, so that was always a goal from day one, which I think is an important part of the case study is that we we're always looking to the future and potentially what the shape of the business could be. Um, they were in no hurry to kind of sell the business in those early stages, but we said it as something that might happen in the future. Um, both Mike and Ronnie um, backed away um, after having a sabbatical. Um, Mike actually wrote a book, uh, which is called Truth, Growth, Repeat, um, which is um, really based on the methodology of Meerkats. And Ronnie had three months off and tried to record an album in the house next to his, but um, on bass guitar actually, but it never really took off. Um, they both kind of backed away at that point. I then appointed two, uh, two new business partners, Martin Beecroft and Mel Weiss, um, in a strategy and a creative role. Martin was a bit was more strongly focused on digital, um, and we started moving the business forward. Um, and at that point, we started looking at um, thinking about how we might um, how we might grow the business. We started looking at, and uh, we were working with Catherine at this point. Um, we started looking at IP development. We started looking at the, the offer um, and started looking at our pricing methodology and our pricing strategies. So starting to think more seriously about how we were styling the business. Um, Meerkats was always a very strategic agency. So we were the largest independent agency in Perth. Um, and, but we were trending more and more to, to consulting work. Um, and that allowed us to kind of stretch our chops in, uh, particularly in the IP development space. Um, at the point in time that we um, came to a decision about merging, we, we actually started really looking at how we could help the founders exit, but also it was driven by the fact that we, we're in a small geography and we really needed support in um, helping us with analytics and tools and data. Um, that was an investment that was probably beyond us as, an, as a small independent in Perth. Um, so we actually had a look at three different options. We looked at management buyout, 
um, and spent a lot of time in the management buyout space looking to whether or not um, the three of us could actually take Mike and Ronnie out, um, out financially. We also looked at um, an individual investor and to see if we could find anyone. My background was in financial services and um, I'd worked in a stockbroking wealth management business. So I had some good um, connections in that space. Um, we did find uh, an, an individual who could help us, but um, he didn't really have a good understanding of the of our business space. Um, so we moved on from that. Um, and then thirdly, we looked at merging. We were actually not looking for a full sale. We were looking for a partner who could come in at a percentage and help us to um, with the level of investment that we needed. Wonderman Thompson had um, had a small um, footprint here in Perth with about 12 people. We had about 40. Um, and so um, I approached the combination of Wonderman Thompson's offer and the Mucat's offer locally was a good match. Um, but we had four or five um, partners that we were looking to, um, to speak to. It just happens that the Wonderman Thompson piece um, actually was successful almost straight off the bat. Um, so I won't go into more detail at this point, but that's the backstory of the of the business. And um, as we move forward, I'll, I'll chip in and um, add some commentary around Catherine and Stephen's pieces. Perfect. Perfect. And it really sets the scene for everybody, Gavin. So thank you, because it, as you probably picked up, we underlined it. It takes a bit of a, a, a process. And so that's what we're going to work through today. Um, how you enter as an MBO potentially, or how you exit passing the bat on to your staff or a merger or an acquiring party. The preparation phase can take years. The negotiation phase, as Stephen will touch on a little later, should not take years. And the tips and traps that the three of us have experienced over the years. So, um, Beck, can you pop onto the next slide? So what we're going to talk about here is the exit and entry options. So depending on whether you're an agency owner wanting to pass down or sell out or merge, um, the preparation that you might need to consider for each of the different styles of passing of the baton, legal, financial, synergy with the other party um, and your own personal resilience through, through this phase. It is quite um, gruelling in some cases, particularly when the lawyers and the financial people tax accountants start crawling all over your figures and asking you the questions. If you're not prepared, it will be tough. So today is really great to set the scene and look, coming out of uh, working with other agencies across the years and through M&A, probably a couple each year for myself, this resilience piece and being ready, ducks in a row, is something you can start today, whether or not you're preparing for sale. Your business should be squeaky clean, crystal clear when it comes to the numbers and financial and legal hand in hand. And then the negotiations, again, the preparation there and a couple of the questions that came through before the session today about um, you know, how do you find someone to help you when do you start courting. So talking about the transaction um, and then earnouts potentially walking away if it's not, not a good deal. And then lastly on that, that third point is like, why are you even doing this? Really have the answer to that question because it will be asked and I can't tell you um, how many people get stopped on that. They actually haven't got a really good, it's sales, we're in sales sometimes. So you need to have the answer and be genuine about what are you going to do next? Had a few um, agency owners over the years in their mid forties who said, yes, I'm going to prepare for sale. And my first question is, well, what are you going to do next? Because they've spent 20 years building this. They don't really, they've got a family possibly, but they don't have a lot of outside activity going on. And, at 40, you don't want to be on the golf course all day by yourself because everyone else is working. So what is it you're going to do next? So, you know, that answer is different for lots of different people. So I'm going to pass to Stephen now to sort of talk through the options about the, the legal structure behind um, your business proprietary limited or partnership for each of these options to sell. Well, thanks, Catherine. <laughs> Of course, uh, so there is an entry options, preparation, negotiation. Just briefly touching on this, it's also important to understand this is a very broad topic and we have a short period of time. So um, it's a highlights tour of all of these important things and hopefully at the end of it, you'll take away some knowledge. But in terms of the options that are open to you, um, uh, Catherine's spoken about it, Gavin's spoken about it. There is no template answer to what is the option. It is comes down to what are you looking for? And if we're talking in the sense of independent media agencies being acquired, what is the acquirer looking for? Uh, and, and it may be a hybrid of some of these options that we see there on the left-hand panel there under options. Um, I have seen 
what the the, 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 the principles of the business that are, that are selling, some have wanted to become the next CEO of the global group that has taken them over. And some have wanted to buy a farm in Cornwall and brew turnip gin um, and everything in between. And, and so, so you have, it's really up to what you're looking for. But in terms of um, MBOs, management buyouts, we've, we've um, Gavin mentioned that that's something he's had experience with. Um, I think most of you would understand what that means. It's you know, the two ICs and unders taking out the existing um, uh, owners in some structure, some way. Uh, succession is uh, what I, I like to think of succession more as a, a sort of a gradual process where there is a plan in place to slowly hand over um, to the, the next generation from the founders perhaps. And that can happen through a new co-company uh, and it happens over a period of time. So we see that. Then we have the, of course, the, the merger, um, which is sometimes we see two strong agencies coming together to merge into a JV agency, which may be a precursor to a then future takeover or future acquisition by a global group. So um, becoming stronger together and then being taken over later on. So again, we often see a, a new co-JV there. Then we have the acquisition um, scenario, which is a, quite a common one, one way or another. And Gavin spoke about his experiences there. And of course, um, we have IPOs, initial public offerings going public. Um, the old days, STW Group, um, WPP, um, AJF Partnership, for example, being acquired in advance of going public. So we see that happening as well. Um, uh, equity, uh, equity sales, um, again, sale of certain parts of the business, whether that be um, some of the equity that's being sold and or assets that are being sold. You can sell the assets out of the business. So there's numerous options that, that are available. In terms of preparation, the, um, the legal, uh, in advance of effectively getting a knock on the door or being proactive and soliciting a deal, um, and looking for someone, you, you really need to have your legal documents in order. And we'll talk about that in more detail in a moment, but your legal documents need to be in order for internal and external stakeholders. Talk about that. Catherine will talk about having the financial and taxation documents in order. Um, the synergy point is just raised there simply because uh, you need to ask yourself, why would this be a good acquisition? Why would why would this work for us and who would we be looking for? And I think very helpfully Gavin set out why um, the, um, the management buyout may not have worked and why an individual investor may not have worked, whereas the acquisition did. So, so you know, what is the synergy? What can they bring to the table for you to maximise any earn out that you might have? And, and Catherine's made a great point on the resilience. It's, it can be a bit of a journey um, and it can be a long one. Uh, except when you start getting to point three, which is the the offer and the negotiations. How does all that go? It's um, it, te it tends to follow a bit of an orthodox pattern. I've found um, sometimes parties come together through interesting ways. They they do it privately between CFOs, or it happens between CEOs, or um, a matchmaker comes in and introduces an agency to a to a group, and and that happens. And sometimes there's two or three um, on the table that are talking to the agency. The agency may be under persistent offers for many years and they're just trying to choose the best one. But it, in any way, the offer comes in, a non-disclosure agreement tends to be signed, and then, off, then the formal offer comes by way of a document. And the document is often a term sheet, a letter of intent, a transaction summary, or a heads of agreement. There's no difference between them. They're the same thing. They're effectively a non-binding, big muscle moves document about what the deal is going to be about. Then, then we see um, the transaction occurring and really falling out of that, we have what's called due diligence, which we'll speak about in a moment. And we have transaction documents being prepared. And that's the type of document that give effect to effectively what is in the term sheet or the letter of intent in the, in the offer document. Um, you could be looking at three to four documents there um, to negotiate in what we would call transaction documents. They can take time. Uh, you need to be prepared for um, internal people to get across it and then the external negotiation, that can take time. So you need to be prepared for that. Um, we mentioned earnouts. Uh, we will talk about earnouts in a little bit more detail later on, 
but I just want to highlight earnout caps, you know, for overperformance. Be careful of having caps put on your earnout because the reason you might be hitting a cap is because you're overperforming and everyone should share in that in that um, upside. The other point about earnouts, which I have actually seen um, happen, particularly in the COVID Mark One last year, was that happened right smack bang in the middle of an agency's earnout period, and the COVID absolutely rocked back the um, and the lockdown rocked back this agency's ability to properly earn out in year two of a three year earn out. And what do you do about that? We call it force majeure, or we call it um, adverse events. That needs to be accommodated, and we'll talk about about that. And one one takeaway before I hand back to Catherine is. At the end of the day, you need to be happy with the upfront that you get. If you get a great deal upfront or you get a significant amount upfront or you're able to um, secure uh, that first bit of money that comes in that you would be happy with um, and the rest is all cream on top, if you can get to that position and that's where you want to try to get to as often as you can, um, then you're protected against such contingencies coming on online later and the unknown and uncertainty. So that's just a, just something I've seen in many deals that it seems to be an important thing and works well. Thanks, Catherine. Great. Right, so let's move on to the next slide. So the question of leave or stay. So sometimes as a business owner, if you're passing the baton to your management buyout team, you will be required to stay in a little longer. Um, or you might want out straight away, depends on that um, preparation phase and how able your 2IC or your underlings are, your second in charge. Similarly, with the, the merge or the acquisition, are you actually going to stay and be part of it and go on to grow? Um, I'm going to pass to Gavin shortly to share what's happened in, in the last six months, you know, since the, the teams have moved in. Some opportunities of like really catapulted them into new stratus field um sometimes though you want to leave so how how quickly are you leaving and is the acquiring party able to let you go or are there some caveats there and the life after the the earn out clauses are again something just to think about what does it look like and how would you share in that and that next chapter for yourself so maybe back to gavin um tell us a little bit uh, since you've started your roles that were uh, have changed somewhat yeah, I mean, we um, the opportunity to look for an investment partner, someone who can help us, was all about growth. Um, so we went into um, all of these discussions looking for ways that we could have greater impact as a business. Um, and given the small geography um, and the quality of the IP that we developed, we were, we were struggling to kind of unleash that. So. Part of the um, discussion with Wonderman Thompson was the was helping um, unleash some of the talent that we've got here and some of the IP within the Wonderman Thompson network. So that's where the match was great. Um, Martin Beecroft, who is our um, um, CCO, um, became is now the um, Chief Technical and Innovation Officer nationally for Wonderman Thompson. Uh, and Mel is um, leads partnerships and all new business um, strategic thinking across the network. And I work with the other managing directors um, to help, particularly on the consulting side of the business and helping growing the consulting angle of Wonderman Thompson in Australia. So for us, it's really allowed us to um, have greater access to um, and use our skills on a wider wider palette and also for our senior people within the business to, to help them to work on national business, which has been great. Yeah, it's really great to hear that. And I think what's important is that for those of you watching today, if you're starting the process or when you get to start the process, choosing the right acquirer or opportunity to merge, have a look at what they need. I think there's a huge missing piece when people are looking to sell their agency. From my experience, that sometimes they're not as detailed as Gavin and the team have been about where are we going and what opportunities are there for us. So it's almost like you can pre-divine your role that you might like and you might actually choose an entity that will give you access through their global network or different sectors that you've not worked in before. So again, the, just, just helping with that um, transition. The other, the other point there is I think that um, choosing a partner that culturally fits you is super important. Um, and you know there's lots of uh, the financials aside and there's agreements and there's lots of paperwork going on but actually having one of the key meetings that we had in our merge conversations was purely chemistry 
and understanding what um, what the relationship would look like um, because it's all nice to talk about what might be once you merge but um, having honest conversations about what it actually will be like an independent going into a network is not an easy thing to do so we had to go in eyes wide open on that Look, I'm just going to draw on that point as well. Um, an acquisition that took place, um, myself being involved a few years ago, where the selling party, the agency that was selling, was very cagey. And we had um, gone through due diligence. Our deposit had been paid to purchase this agency. Their staff and clients and suppliers, partners had not yet been told. And it was getting quite close to settlement date. And it really was. You could There was definitely something not right. And the culture the cultural fit, the chemistry was starting to really bubble over. It wasn't what we thought. So um, it was a walk away moment. Um, the acquiring agency didn't walk away. And three years later now, it unfortunately has not yielded any results from that acquisition. So um, it, it was very disappointing, but there was that, that window of opportunity where the chemistry was not right, the cultural fit was not right, the conversations were not feeling right. So it's very um, emotional and during this transaction phase that we're talking about uh, being surrounded by the right advisors because they should have walked away at that point. Perhaps they felt it was too far gone. So again, just be aware that sometimes it can be, re it's really important as we're saying, but you need to see what's important to have your value and your avatars as to what, what will work for you. Okay, next slide please, Beck. Let's have a look at the structure. So um, just briefly, I mean, on the taxation side and the, the formal legalities of whether you're a partnership, unit share, trust, um, it, there is a preference sometimes when you are selling. The intellectual property and data is really important too. This is an area of all agencies, for those of you who know me, um, and as Gavin alluded to earlier, for my, for my money's worth, it's the smarts within your business that's really important. A lot of you are selling creativity and strat strategy. Um, the off systems and processes, the proprietary way you do things are hugely valuable, as well as your team. And some of the agencies I've worked with, certainly their seniors, that you can't benchmark some of these people. They are the only person in Australia that does X. So again, you've got some huge intellectual property and um, intangible assets with your people and the structures. The relationships you have also are hugely valuable. So that will be the contracts that you have with your your clients, your suppliers, um, your internal people as well, and your freelancers and consultants. So again, an area, there was actually some questions on the way in about you know, signed up-to-date contracts. Just a little thing, but it should be a checklist. Yes, all clients are up-to-date. Yes, all staff are up-to-date. Yes, we have NDAs and SLAs with our third-party suppliers. Yes, we own all intellectual property, so we can sell it. So all of these little things, um, you might think they have nothing to do with finance, but they have everything to do with it because they're valuable pieces of collateral that you will be looking to give the acquirer comfort or if you're selling to your team, give them comfort that it's all locked down. Um, just one little sidestep on that, the Photon Group in acquiring their multiple agencies and sometimes sole traders, they actually looked at the termination clause for most of their contracts, the client contracts. So if your client contract says it's a 30-day notice period, then it's only valued to me for 30 days. Even if you have a three-year recurring retainer, I'm only interested in that termination clause. So again, have a look at that. See it as something significant, something you can market if you've got six months or one year or you're linking them to staff. So there's lots of little tricks to make sure that your, your company is more valuable than an alternative. Um, Stephen, across to you to have a look at it from the legal perspective. Well, thanks, Catherine. So at the end of the day, um, getting prepared legally, uh, it's, I think the point's already been made that you establish the conditions for success early and you get underway with um, your legal tax instruction in the early days of your agency. And if you're able to start building your data room and your um, your legal your legal financial um, uh, pre-due diligence, if I may put it that way, in advance of any knock on the door or any solicitation, you'll be well ahead um, of any, of any um, uh, or, and, and you will impress any potential acquirer who may come. Because it just takes a long time to pull all that together if that's not in order um, when the knock on the door comes. Um, that also involves ensure, ens ensuring internal and external stakeholder documentation is in order, um, which I'll come on to in a moment. 
and that your key partner, your key partners are aligned in what's happening and that everyone's in the same boat, pulling the oars in the same direction. You don't have a partner or a shareholder who doesn't want to do this. And then engaging with your two ICs and asking which stakeholder, two IC stakeholder needs to come into the tent and be aware of what's happening and at what stage they do the rest of the staff know well, that comes down later. So in terms of structure, um, how are you structured now? Uh, are you a company? Are you a trust structure? Are you a historical style partnership? Are you a sole trader? Um, and really, uh, from what I can see, regardless of what type of transaction we're talking about, we'll look at the different ways in which these things can happen, I think on the next slide. But um, from what I've seen, acquirers prefer to buy companies, if, if that's the type of transaction we're talking about. Shares in a company. Um, it, as opposed to buying assets in an asset sale, which is another way it can be done, which we'll come on to in a moment. So it may be, and I have seen it several times actually, that when the acquirer has come along, they've said, well, you're in a unit trust structure or you're a classic old partnership, but what we want you to do is um, put, your, put yourself into a um, company structure so we can buy the shares. So you might have to have what I call an internal M&A process that happens first. But of course, if you structured yourself properly from the start um, for future acquisition, uh, whether or not that happens in the short, middle or long term or at all, um, but if it's structured correctly, then that'll be so much easier for you because it can be quite a lot of work. Um, again, regardless of how you're structured, it needs to be properly documented. You've got to have your shareholder agreements or your trust agreements or your unit holders agreements or your partnership agreements all well in order and in the data room ready to go. We spoke about IP and data. Of course, IP and data these days is an intangible asset and a very valuable asset in the business. And it's something that um, will be looked at by any potential acquirer. Gavin spoke of the proprietary IP and, and significant IP that they had developed in his agency and that were valuable to the acquirer. We're talking about ensuring that you've got your trademarks registered, you've got your copyright notices where they need to be. You have IP asset registers that understand what intellectual property you have developed. Um, you have your data and personal information properly collected. And we're talking about, in this case, personal information so privacy laws apply, privacy policies and collection notices. Do you use, do you collect, use and disclose personal data in a lawful way? Is it something that can be used by the acquirer because they will be checking this during due diligence? Um, have you protected your data and proprietary IP in the right ways? Do you have you used technology to protect it? Have you got plans in place? to protect your um, IP and data, and more and most importantly, agreements that protect all of that. And that leads on to the relationships. These are the things that, particularly the internal, external stakeholder relationships that will form part of any formal legal due diligence. And again, you'd be surprised how many agencies I've seen don't quite have all these aligned and have these ducks in a row. Um, employment agreements, with employees that are Fair Work Act compliant, uh, independent contractor and freelancer agreements that are legally compliant and particularly properly allocate um, the individual to whether they're an employee or an independent contractor for tax, superannuation, payroll and insurance purposes. Um, sometimes there is problems and I've seen situations where um, for many years an agency was paying independent uh, people as independent contractors, as, as freelancers, um, and then they were stuck with a, they were hit by an audit by the, the, the state revenue body, and they were required to pay back a significant amount of money in payroll tax, um, and that affected the um, earnout because uh, the warranties were enlivened in the contracts. Employment policies, workplace health, sa health safety, COVID safe workplaces, all of those things, um, don't forget employment policies in terms of IT policies, email policies, social media policies are all still very important. Everyone's focusing on COVID safe workplaces at the moment, but they all remain very important. On the external stakeholder front, 
client agreements. You couldn't, that's so important. And as Catherine mentioned, what are you buying? 30 day terms in, uh, in a notice of uh, convenience termination, or do you have a solid two years? Uh, what are the change in control provisions? What happens if you do want to sell your agency? Do you need the client to buy in and agree to this because they have a change in control provision that allows them to terminate early if you don't tell them about it or there's a change in control. So your client agreements on many levels need to be up to date and buttoned down. Your supplier agreements uh, with suppliers that give do work for you, like whether they do develop IP for you or systems or software, you need to make sure that you're owning the IP of that. So it adds to the value a number of times um, agencies I've seen have developed IP, but they forgot to get the IP assigned to them. And suddenly they're trying to chase IP and, and, and next thing you know, they're being asked to pay more money for the IP that thought they'd owned. Um, likewise, subcontractor agreements, super important, where you have your services are supplemented by subcontractors, which collectively allow you to and, um, provide deliverables and services to an end client the contracts between the end client, your agency and the subcontractor need to be in harmony. They need to allow for the flow of, of responsibilities and liabilities, IP and all sorts of things um, to ensure that um, you as the agency are in the strongest possible position with your clients um, and the people that you're paying your subcontractors so that an acquirer sees that and go, well, that's all buttoned down. Um, these days we're seeing a huge shift towards um, inclusion of what we call social responsibility provisions, such as anti-bribery, anti-corruption, privacy, data, modern slavery, et cetera, et cetera. So whether or not they ever become enlivened as real things, they are super important. Um, privacy and data particularly is going to be, we're going to face a massive change in that landscape when the digital platform inquiry wrap, wrap, um, wraps up and we see um, changes to the privacy law and um, new privacy um, mandatory codes of practice come into place within the next 12 months. Insurance as well. So there's some of the things to keep in mind for structure, brand and relations. Uh, and I'll hand back to you. Yeah, so we might, um, I mean, it, it feels like this is stuff that, well, it is, it's things that you wouldn't usually do in your agency and it might not ring your bell at all, but you actually need to have it all done. So my recommendation is, as we slip, slip to the next slide back, Let's turn it into something that's visually really exciting. And we want to look at the key metrics, valuation, the legalities and the relationships, everything we've talked about, even on the financial side, it's P&Ls, balance sheets, the intangible asset register. There's a whole bunch of stuff you need to have organised. But I might get you to go to the next slide, Beck. Try and make it look good. So I've just given a couple of examples today to show how I like to work with my agencies from a financial perspective. I really want it to be visual and I want it to, it's obviously backed by all the hardcore data at the back. And I really think you can apply this sort of infographic style dashboarding with Stephen's legalities as well. So, you know, when he was talking about all the various documents, if you've got your, you know, 24 employee contracts up to date with Fair Work, you've got five, you know, key external partners, make it look good. I've got five of them, I've got 24 of them, my termination clauses are, my retainer dates are, make it look visual and have them all in a data vault. It's the same with your financials. Predominantly at KMIT, we work on four and four only programs, a budget and forecast, historic and future years. We look at end of month monthly management reporting structure, which has all of these pie charts in it, referring to that data. We have a KPI program that all of our staff work towards, aligned to the goals, and we have a pipeline. Critical, so I'm sure most of you have these things, but you as a business owner maybe even know in your head, maybe you don't have the financial people on site to provide you with this and the external accountants don't usually get into this commercial territory. But the people that work for you should be able to understand and provide these as well. If they're account managers, they should be managing their portfolio, looking at their future forecasting a pipeline, looking at what intangible assets they have, make sure they're using their copyright symbol and trademark on logos and taglines, proprietary information. Make sure when you're pitching that you use it. What you're looking at here is just a collection of things that I think are important for you to have your ducks in a row from a financial perspective. Top left, your key P&L and balance sheet metrics, your gross profit margins, um, your billings per head, a great industry metric. 
And I guess that then makes me think and, and make mention, if you're selling within the industry, these metrics are key to understand what are the benchmarks. So working with agencies and I guess industry bodies like IMAA, I have, the benchmarking is something that just comes second nature to me. What is the average? Where do you sit? Are you above or below? Maybe in some things you're above, some things you're below. It doesn't matter if you're below because that's maybe why you're selling because you see great opportunity. It really doesn't matter. It's your story that matters. The pie charts you see there, the services, the sectors, the territory, things that you might talk about, but what do you offer? What are your services? Maybe there's a big gaping hole there that another agency offers something that you don't have, but then you've got stuff they don't have, so it will be a match made in heaven. Explore that, be able to project what might actually happen if you came together. The sectors as well became very important during COVID particularly. So having that diversification so that you're not exposed to an industry that actually didn't do so well. Conversely, then maybe you're an industry that's gone gangbusters and now that suddenly they've become the lion's share of your revenue. So that balance again of um, split a percentage around your client mix and territory. So where do you service? So again, looking for someone to buy you, maybe you look globally. So you expand into other territories. Um, and that way there are others also looking to enter the APAC region. You can see the intangibles there. I know it's a bit small, but the brand, your staff, and I mentioned this before, your partners and your proprietary processes. Don't underestimate that. Um, even linking some of that to your P&L. So most agencies I work with will have fee income or um, consultancy income and production media. But very rarely do we see a line for intellectual property. So your concept fees and strategic that you've just sold outright um, or ongoing trademark renewals or if you've got any license fees coming in, really important to show that as separate. Um, I've mentioned that just in the middle, you can see a little table there, revenue streams, project revenue versus retainer revenue and annuities. So your annual sorts of things that are really important. And products. So again, some agencies I've worked with have created products that are really important and de delivering unit pricing. Um, on the left there, you've got your, your payback proposition. So again, this can be built and automatically updates itself. So something to consider having it automatically propagating. Um, next slide, please, Beck. As she clicks. So another view here, and this is looking at the multiples. So I know many of you, there was at least 12 of you on the way in who wanted to know about the multiples. So I can tell you that a multiple can be can be one right through to a five. And if you're going to have a multiple of five, what is it? Is a multiple of your revenue or your turnover or your or profit? So it can be any of those, as Stephen said at the beginning. It, it really is a very subjective and individual pricing um, sale at the time. So every deal is done differently. Three is about the industry norm, but you better have good reason for multiplying whichever I said, turnover, revenue, or EBITDA, or EBIT at three times. And so you're gonna know that when you work it up as to what that price is, you've gotta be able to justify it so that your buyer, or if you're selling it to your, your people, M MBO, can understand that that is a reasonable price and what's the payback period? When do they expect to earn that investment back? How quickly can they get it back? It is an industry sector multiple um, and it's usually based on your, your earnings multiples or you could also look at some price earning ratio calcs or future earnings, that's those three at the top there. I would recommend you have all three calculating at all times. It's simple. It's a simple formula that just sits in your dashboard using your P&L and balance sheet data and just updating each month you run your management reports. It's pretty easy to set up. Once it's set up, it just tracks and rolls along and you can have the historic data and then you can use it to project what it might look like if your revenue increases or you add more staff. A low multiple means it's a high risk business. That's gonna be because it relies on you to get all the business and run the business. A low risk multiple conversely means you've got a team underneath you. This is also a question I spotted on the way in where you've got really valuable, clever people. Make sure they're linked to a client. So if you grow a client, they go with that client. If they need more team under them, but they're running that client or that portfolio. If you lose that client, you technically would lose them as well, but make them absolutely critical as part of the sale. 
Again, with the juniors, make sure that they've got critical aspects in their KPIs, in their JDs, their job descriptions. But when you sell the business, it's paramount that they go because they do all your social or they, they have something key that is relevant to the business and vital that they stay with the business. Um, other high values might be the unique IP that we mentioned before. Low debt. So if you've got loans and back pays, uh, certainly in the COVID time, this is a tricky one for some. But make sure you look at the tra trajectory. I did see that question as well. So go pre-COVID, look at the bumpy years that you've had before, and then keep the trajectory going that way. If the growth was slow and steady, keep going. Show the COVID results, but show what it would have been. And then maybe you're reserving this sale process for another couple of years and go for those targets to get yourself back up to where you need to be. Turnover, value, and measurement and predict. So the turnover, again, just looking on whether you're a small, medium, or large agency, this will again help you with your multiples. Um, if you're a sole trader, you've still got something, or even if you're a, a team of five, you've still got something that's worth having. It's probably your clients and your staff. So don't underestimate what you've got there. Um, touch on the client contracts again, even if they're not fully signed up and up to date, your history and longevity with a client is very important, as long as it doesn't rely on one person, you the owner, and you're exiting. So just a couple of tips on that. Um, let's move to the next slide. Unless Gavin, do you want to add anything about the financials and legal side that you had your ducks in a row, no doubt? Yeah, I think the, the main thing is um, looking at your financials and getting your financials in shape on a monthly basis so that um, if someone does walk in the door or if you um, wants to have a look at, at the business, it's in good shape when you're doing it. We focused less on, less on the, the, multi, uh, the multiple and more on the business shape so that we were well prepared for a conversation because in the end, the multiple is affected by a whole, by the negotiation itself. Um, what style of yeah. um, merge or sale is going to happen? Um, you know, so it's, it's very different for different scenarios and there's a number of ways that you can actually earn out over a period. So um, making sure that you've got um, a really clean um, financial system so that you can answer all the questions and, and you look like a professional business coming in is probably the best advice. Yeah, and sometimes in my experience, that takes probably six months to a year to get it like that and get your team reporting in, in such a way that it's automated and that you've cleared out any, you know, did 7A director loans or you're not running personal stuff through the business and the structure is neat. Um, Ed, can you go forward a couple of slides? So past the financial ones. So go forward. Uh, one back, sorry. Yep, here we go. So uh, one back now, sorry. Yeah, so we'll go to these last couple of slides where we're looking at the tips and traps and conscious of time for everybody. So over the years working with different agencies, different sizes and different scenarios, Stephen, myself, Gavin also have got some, a couple of, I guess, learnings, war stories. Um, the formal due diligence process for me and having the NDA that's two-way two and also at what point do you know this is a serious discussion? For me, it have been the learnings, the tips that I, I'd urge you to look out for. Um, and, and the trap, I guess, as I mentioned before, just sense if something's not right, you don't feel this conversation is as friendly as it was or it's getting messy, then it might be time to walk away. They'd probably might be my two um, tips and traps for you. What about you, Stephen? For you, um, audio. <laughs> I'd like to, um, thank you. I'd like to, um, uh, always look at the NDA being two way because whilst everyone focuses on, oh my goodness, what sort of due diligence will be coming the agency's way by the potential acquirer, legal, financial, operational, um, technical, whatever, um, you need to know who is the acquirer. Um, and you may need to do a light reverse due diligence on them and they will need to disclose information to you and you know, they may be a, a global holding company, but the company in Australia proposing to acquire you may be a $2 company. So we've required parent company guarantees and all sorts of things around that. So it is a two way street. And, and in order to get the chemistry right, yes, you sit in the room and it sounds good. Chemistry sounds good. Now we want to see some information from acquirer as well. So that's really important. Um, in terms of another tip I can give is look, whilst you can have the best legal documents in the world, 
um, and the best structure um, and the best clauses, there's nothing quite as good as giving as limited disclosure as you can and only giving away the information that you need to. And so um, it, the prevention is better than cure. So really be careful um, in terms of what you do disclose, particularly during the initial phase when you're doing the initial get together and discussions and before the, 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 the strong due diligence sets in. If, if, if an organisation or an acquirer is going to spend the money in developing transaction documents and going and paying for a legal and a financial due diligence, they're serious. That's when you give them more information. But be very careful what you give up front on the strength of a three-page NDA. I mean, that's what I mentioned there about the trap. Beware of the recon mission, because I have seen it where the, the whole um, you know, pretense of an acquisition was simply to get competitive information. Mm. And I, it does happen. Um, it's rare, but it can happen. So that's my track to watch out for there, Catherine. So we'll flip to the last slide and I'm conscious of the time and I know Gavin has a hard stop in about four minutes. So any last minute tips from you, Gavin, as we kind of wrap up for today? Uh, yeah, my main one is that um, although these things, these conversations are really financial in orientation, like, um, it's also very emotional. Um, there's people who have come together to build a, build a business together as business partners, you've been in business for a long time. Um, having the open conversation about what each of the individuals wants out of the transaction and out of the um, out of the um, the merge or the sale itself is really important. You're better off going to counselling before you actually um, get into the nitty gritty of it because you know there's money involved, things change. Um, it is a very stressful process. You're dealing with a lot of um, a lot of information. Not everyone's financially oriented. So have those conversations up front and it'll make it a lot smoother is probably my main tip. Fantastic. Well, look, thanks, Gavin. Um, are there any questions for Gavin before he goes from the audience? How did you want to handle that, Sam or Beck? Um, look, we've got a mature audience. We can put uh, speak up or throw it in the chat box if you want to. Sometimes the guys are a little bit quiet, so... <laughs> I've got some questions. Um, so, Gavin, if you need to go, let, let's just say thank you anyway. Um, of course, if the audience wants to reach out to you and buy you a beer and have a chat, I'm sure you'll be up to that at some point when the borders are open. I mean, I'm, happy, I'm happy to do virtual beers. That's fine. Yeah, great. Fantastic. <laughs> so, look, um, thank you again. And I'll just um, kick off with a couple of questions if you like. But it mostly was around the staffing and the... Um, and the multiples and the value, which I think we've fairly much covered unless there are any more detailed ones um, that you've got there, Sam or Beck, anyone for, for any questions at this stage. Otherwise, we're happy, Stephen and I, to respond to those separately after the event as well. Yeah, no questions at this point come through the chat feature, so maybe just press ahead. All right, Great. I'll, and, and what... I'll jump off. Thank you, guys. All right, thanks. Bye, Gavin. Thank you. Thanks, Gavin. Great. Well, we can stop share then. I might just um, pretty much wrap up. So I, I do have a lovely long list here about, you know, how do you get a good valuation? How do you get someone to help you? So I guess this is where, you know, Stephen and I really wanted to introduce ourselves to you. Even if it was just a quick chat that you wanted to have with us to, you know, chew our ear on how to start, get, get the right foot forward here. Um, there are some of you already IMAA members that we've worked with as well. So it is, from my mind, it is set and forget. If you're not ready to sell, just set up your financials, get it in a row, get those dashboards just automatically producing, have your bookkeeper, bookkeepers load up the figures, um, and then you're pretty much going to be clear if you've got the right targets there as to what your business is worth, and it will keep updating every month until you're ready to actually sell. You could use a broker, you could do your own sleuthing around as Gavin and his team did, um, or it might be an unsolicited approach in which hey, somebody approaches you and asks you how much. But if you duck through in a row, you'll know the answer. Um, or you'll call your financial advisor or you'll call Stephen, your legal advisor, and we'll, we'll then shelter you around what we know is the best practice. Don't give it all away. Don't talk about it too much in the first instance. A bit like dating, really, isn't it? You kind of keep a few cards up your sleeve. Stephen, do you have any last-minute words? Microphone. Microphone. 
Stephen, put your microphone on. I keep doing this. Um, the legal side, all I wanted to mention is that part, parting thought was the legal side uh, follows on. Um, it, it, you can't avoid it. Um, it. The acquirers will very much be across the legals. They'll want to see historical legals. They'll want to enter into significant transaction documents generally. Um, and if they don't, then you'd have to ask, you know, why are we doing this on a flimsy, in a flimsy legal structure um, or acquisition structure? So they generally we will be strong transaction documents. And the one thing to always remember is it doesn't end once the documents are signed. The documents do go into the drawer, but it's very important to remember that there's a performance piece um, throughout the life of the earnout or the life of the contract, um, unless everything is bought up front um, and you pay, you're paid out and you walk away, which generally doesn't happen. So it's always important to make sure you're tracking the contract and you're tracking what you need to do in the event that there's something that adverse that could happen if you don't do that. And um, again, what those things are, it just depends on the deal and um, you just need to get good guidance to navigate your, your way through that. But right. They don't have to be overly good. Yeah. Well, I might pass back to you, Sam. I mean, our job, Stephen and mine, really is just to share what we know. Um, my job, just to make sure you get the best value for your agency. So thank you once again for inviting us to speak with your members. It's been a real pleasure.